Okay. So starting with Pied Beauty. Glory be to God for dappled things, for skies of couple color as a brinded cow, for rose moles all in stipple upon trout that swim, fresh fire coal chestnut falls, finches wings, landscape plotted and pieced, fold, fallow, and plow, and all trades their gear and tackle and trim, all things counter, original, spare, strange, whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how, with swift, slow, sweet, sour, a dazzle, dim, he fathers forth whose beauty is past change, praise him. Okay, one more time. Pied beauty. And by the way, if, if you're feeling, gee, there's some words here you don't understand, yeah, that, we'll take care of that. That happens to, to everyone. And even words that, yeah, I know what that word means, but I have no idea how he's using it there. That's Hopkins. That's Hopkins. Like I'm saying, he was on his own wavelength. Um, he was writing for himself and God. And he knew God would understand. So pied beauty. That word pied, there's one other place you ever hear that word, if you remember the story of the Pied Piper of Hamlin. Right? The, who, uh, and, and it refers to the, um, uh, the clothing that he was wearing. So pied means, um, uh, 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 what's that word? Very colored, you know, like spotted, spotted. Spotted outfit. So this is all about looking around and seeing um, everything in creation as being spotted, as being contrasts. And just the something amazing about that. Glory be to God for dappled things for skies of couple color as a brinded cow, for rose moles all in stipple upon trout that swim, fresh fire coal chestnut falls, finches wings, landscape plotted and pieced, fold, fallow, and plow, and all trades their gear and tackle and trim, all things counter, original, spare, strange, whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how, with swift, slow, sweet, sour, a dazzle, dim. He fathers forth whose beauty is past change. Praise him. Okay, so... Let's uh, take our shoes off and run through this. I'm going to unmute you, so um, you know, feel free to jump in, stop me, ask stuff, offer stuff. Um, so, glory be to God for dappled things. Right away, we're, we're seeing... Uh, Along with the content, along with the meaning, we're seeing Hopkins' favorite poetic device, which is alliteration, right? Glory be to God, uh, that, the, those two G sounds. Um, and we see that, uh, okay, uh, I'm, I'm going to mute you again. No. No, okay. Okay. Um, there we are. Okay. Um, 
Yeah. So if you want to jump in, you know what? Uh, raise your hand. So Hopkins loves alliteration. Um, and think about as we continue to, to go through this here, uh, keep your eye, your ears open for the alliteration and see if you can try to get a sense of why. Is it just, okay, it's fun, it's like, you know, it's like a, a decorative thing, or is there something more to it? Is there something that you get from that that somehow is connected with what he's seeing, with what he's saying? Glory be to God for dappled things, for skies of couple color. So there again is the alliteration, c c couple color, um, and also the, the L's. So couple color. Right, we we know the word couple. We know the word color. We've probably never seen those words joined together before to make a new word. But that's what that's what Hopkins did. You know, if 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 the thing you want to say is not in the language, then you you make it up. Um, so you know, this little kid went, "What color is the sky?" You know, the little kid takes out the crayons and says, "Okay, the sky is blue." Well, is it? You know, is it is it blue? Which blue? Is it navy blue? Is it, is it all one color? Uh, sometimes it's a lot of colors, especially when there's there's different clouds, different atmospheric things going on. There's variation. Maybe you know we're getting close to sunset. Um, so different colors going on in the sky. Pay attention. It's like you know, looking at the the hole in the ground uh, in 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 that story. Um, so great. We can all look up at the sky and appreciate, wow, look at the pretty sunset. Look at all the pretty colors. But what else has he got? A brinded cow. Yeah, brinded or brinded. I think it's pronounced brinded. It means a, it means a cow that's got some partly brown uh, I think that word brinded comes from the word brown, but then the brown is mixed with other colors. Okay? So, okay, he's seeing that beauty of the dappledness of the vari var the variegations in the sky, but also in a cow. Right? We might be less likely to sit there and look at the side of a cow and go, wow, cow. Right? But, but he does. And notice how, again, the, the alliteration, cow, the C in cow, picks up the C's in couple color. So now we have, yeah, Tova, talk to me. Oh, I have to unmute you. I, I, I have to unmute you. Okay, I got you. What is alliteration? Ah, thank you. How um, do you spell it? Yes, alliteration is spelled A L L. I T E R A T I O N. I'll do it again. A L L I T E R A T I O N. Alliteration. Good. Thank you. What um, is it? Okay. Alliteration is repetition of consonant sounds. Repetition of consonant sounds. Like like we have the the g g in the first line then in the second line we have the k k k couple color cow mm. okay um oh, okay yeah we're we're more you you know kind of the most basic um uh, what they call ornament in 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 poetry at least in most western poetry uh is rhyme Right. It's so. So we have the repetition of of sounds at the ends of lines, usually vowel sounds, you know, or or has to include the vowel sound, you know. How now, brown cow is is rhyme, but but and and it gives a sense of some kind of connection. But alliteration, just re by repeating the consonant sounds, gives it. It's a different kind of sense of of connection. And I think that to answer my own question from a few minutes ago, um, I, I think that the
the sense that I get from Hopkins is the reason he's so in love with alliteration. Uh, I'm going to mute you. Um, sorry. Um, I think he's so in love with alliteration because it's like, you know, we would think of a cow as one thing and the couple colored sky as another thing. And by the way, that, that cuh sound is in sky as well. I missed that one. Um, we think th they're very separate things, but it's as if it's as if the consonant sounds show a secret connection between all the different things. Like a vein, just as the as the sameness of the sound runs through the different words, it's showing the sameness of something, the sameness of some essence running through the different objects that he's describing. Is that making sense? And of course, for him, that, that essence that runs through it all is God. It's the glory of God. It's just, it's, it's only, you look around, he's only seeing one thing. He's just seeing God, just seeing the infinite exhibiting itself in all these, through all these different forms. Just seeing the one glorious, divine, formless, expressing itself through all these forms. And it's as if he's almost subliminally, he's not just saying that, okay, it's all that same one glory. He does say that, but he's not just saying that. It's as if he's conveying the experience of the sameness of it all to us through the sounds of the words, through the, the, con the connections of the sounds of the words. That's what makes it poetry. that i are you all hearing that is that that resonating for you good good okay um for rose moles all in stipple upon trout that swim okay so now we we go down to the stream we look at trout okay but if you really look at a trout with, uh, you know, it might have a pink, pinkish body with maybe dark colored round spots on it, what look like moles. Or maybe it'll have, I don't know, rose colored spots, something like that. He's conveying something like that. Um, or stippled, you know, stippled is like, like, right? Um, so there it is, the same thing. We see it in the sky, we see it on the cow, we see it on the trout. Where else can we see it? Fresh fire coal chestnut falls. Fresh fire coal chestnut falls. Okay. So a fire coal. Again, he's making up words here. He's, he's inventing new words out of old words. A fire coal, right? Clear, but that, that, that's easy. It's a coal in the fire. Okay, so, so he, he's, he's bringing us in the house for the for at least for the moment here. He's bringing us to a night nighttime scene with the fire going. You look at the coals. You know, a lot of this stuff. I think most of us saw this way when we were young children. You know. I mean, I can remember as a kid sitting by the fireplace, watching the coals glowing and changing and, you know, all the variations of the subtle variations of the reds and the oranges and the pinks and the different, you know, it was just, you know, what could be more fascinating? Uh, most of us stopped doing that when we get older. Looks like Hopkins did not stop doing that. He kept that, that child's, that ability to see through the eyes of a child, but then express it in this extremely sophisticated language that a child can't do. So there's the fresh fire coal. Chestnut falls. Okay, so when, chest, when chestnuts fall from the tree onto the, the ground, um, he was living in the, the countryside of Wales, by the way, when he wrote this. Um, so he, you know, 
he wasn't just imagining this stuff. He was walking around seeing it, noting it down in his journal, and then organizing it into poems. Uh, so when a chestnut falls and it opens, um, it's there's some brownish color, but there's a you know you look close. There's an iridescent stuff going on there, very much like like the fire coal. And interesting, there's no punctuation between fresh fire coal and chestnut falls. Right? And I think what he's doing there um, is he's actually talking, I think he's actually still outside, right? Because all the other images are outdoor images. He's actually talking about chestnut falls, but he's using fresh fire coal as like an adjective to describe what the 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 fallen burst open chestnuts look like on the inside they look like little glowing coals finch's wings okay there's a we get finches around our house here and there's all kinds of finches house finches which are pink tinged, the gold finches, which are, you know, gold, yellow, and so forth. Um, all these different subtle variations of color. There may be another, just a very subtle kind of subtext here with his choice of finches, you know, all the different kinds of birds that he could mention here. Um, of course, finch conveniently s starts with an F to... to Fit, fit with the alliteration in that line. Um, but right around this time, you had Charles Darwin st uh, starting to publish his work and um, come up with his theories of the, the, the origin of species. And, and one of the major studies that he did was of the beaks of finches. And seeing the the variations in the shapes of the of the finches' beaks. So when Darwin, with his great scientist mind, saw all that, what he saw was okay. All these kind of genealogies and how all this kind of you know just random process of 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 changes and survival of the fittest, blah blah blah, could could give rise to these different kinds of of beaks. And so maybe in a subtle way, Hopkins is saying, yeah, yeah, Darwin, that's fine. But when I look at finches, I see God. <laughs> Landscape, plotted and pieced. Aha. Uh -huh. So now for the first time, we see something man-made. We, we're seeing the print of... of of human activity. It's still nature. We're still outdoors. It's still the landscape, but it's landscape plotted and pieced. In other words, it's, it's um, um, cultivated land. And in fact, he gets more specific. Fold, fallow, and plow. Okay, this is three different things you can do with the land. You can make like a, a sheep fold Right, the area, the enclosure for where you keep your sheep. Um, you can um, plow the land to cultivate it, to plant, or you let it lie fallow. And and in fact, you have to alternate. You you plow land for a while, grow stuff there for a season or a couple of seasons. Then you have to l let it lie fallow for a season, to like for the soil to recover. So. Good, whatever you got. It's like, you know, Hopkins is saying, what do you got? The sheepfold? Glorious. <laughs> the, the fallow land? Glorious. The plowed land? Glorious. Different. I like the difference. Show me the contrast. It's, it's all God showing what, what she can be in all her glory. Uh, it, it's fine if, if human activity is part of it. That works too. Um. And then he gets, in the next line, gets deeper into human activity. And all trades, their gear and tackle and trim. 
right? So now we could be just in the whatever, the blacksmith shop or, or you know, it just any, we can be completely out of what we think of the natural environment now, um, you know, because it's easy to say, oh, yeah, good, I see the divine in nature. But guess what? It's all nature. Even what we think of, what we don't usually think of as, as nature, because it's all expressing the same beingness through different modes of, of activity, different modes of, of doing. All trades, their gear and tackle and trim. So he's looking at, you know, what's your gear? Oh, you've got saddles on this horse and, and bits and spurs and all. What? He's just looking at it all and going, wow but saying it much more eloquently than that. So then, then notice there's a break. There's a little bit of, of white space. Uh, this is basically a sonnet. Uh, the standard sonnet is in 14 lines. This one is in, I think, 10 and a half lines. So he's, he, he's, he, there's a completely experimental variation on the sonnet form. But the basic thing, which is that the sonnet the f is always in two sections. The first section uh, traditionally is eight lines and the second is six lines. So one a little longer, one a little shorter. And usually the first one kind of sets things up. And then the second part of the sonnet somehow mm, makes something of it, brings it home. Uh, often the first half of the part of the sonnet poses a problem or a question. The second part addresses it, answers it, resolves it. So, so in this case, he's kind of, the second part is kind of summing it up. All things counter, original, spare, strange. Whatever is fickle, freckled. Now, interesting, fickle means right changing and it's a word that usually we think of as a negative word oh i thought she was my friend but she was so fickle changeable but he's celebrating that 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 in in the course of time things and people change that's all the glory it's all the glory of being this and then freckled the first time i ever read this poem in high school I was very excited because I I kind of still have them but I had a lot of freckles then I go okay Hopkins says I'm cool I'm freckled um, whatever is fickle freckled so freckled is changing in space right in you know if we go from from this little bit of space over here spatially move over half an inch okay here's a different skin tone so but of course now here he's summing up he's he's describing all of creation like that it's it's fickle and it's freckled it changes in time it changes in space it's all changing and then very interesting in parentheses who knows how who knows how like how does this happen how does this happen you know Darwin can explain it up to a point, how the changes come about. Um, but, you know, there's a, there's a thing in philosophy, someone's paradox, is this Zeno's paradox? Bob, maybe you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, or someone. Um, in order to but we can, we can experience this actually. If let's say I'm holding my hand here, you might want to try this. I'm I'm holding my hand here. If I want my hand to move, I don't want my hand to be here anymore. I want it to be here. Okay. First, it's sitting still. It's sitting still. Then it's going to move. How do I get from hand sitting still to hand moving? Don't think, experience, explore. How do I get from hand still to hand moving?
Because to be moving, it's got to be moving. How can it be moving when it's still? When, I don't know if I'm able to convey this. No, Yaffa tells me no. I'm not. I'm not. Con- Is anyone getting? This made sense to me when I was little. I I, I spent hours. I I was also strange. Going. And really explain, like, wait, how do I do this? And I remember I used to try to see, okay, can I move my, can I do, can I do it before I think it? It's like I was trying to find, where's that impulse to move it? How can an impulse that I'm thinking, I'm having this thing in the mind, and then it happens in the body? How do I do that? Is this res- sound okay? Sounds like I, I can't find a way to convey this. Does it feel at least at all puzzling to you? Even getting a sense of the puzzlement. Okay, it's just me. <laughs> never, never mind <laughs> about that one. Anyway, Hopkins understood. Who, who knows? He understood that he didn't understand. Who knows how? How does it happen? How can? How? How do we? How do we get all this change? What? What keeps it all going? You know, we can explain the mechanics of it to a certain extent. Well, oh, you know, I had two brothers, and all three of us had a lot of freckles. And my parents, and and we we would meet grown ups. And and the grown-ups would invariably say, where did you get all those freckles? You know, they were being cute. Where did you get all those freckles? Um, and so, and, and we would be completely puzzled. We didn't know what to tell th- these people. So we went to our, the three of us, Ross, Dean, and Eric, we got together, we went to our I forget if it was my mom or my dad. And we said, what, what should we tell people when they ask, where did you get all those freckles? And I think it was my mom. She said, you can tell them unequal pigmentation. So from then on in, the smart-ass grown-ups would say, where do you get all those freckles? And the three of us in chorus would joyfully shout, unequal pigmentation. We had no idea what it meant. And even right now, looking at that, okay, what does that mean, unequal pigmentation? It means I've got freckles. (laughs) So it's like, why? Because. There's some, there's, you know, we we can explain mechanics if we study about pigmentation of skin and find what's in the DNA, who did I get, which ancestor I got that from. We can explain it up to a point, but what makes that happen? What makes that change? What makes that variation? We, you know, keep going back, back, back. All these chains of cause and effect that give rise to all this difference, all this change in life. Going all, we have to go back to the Big Bang or back to let there be light. How does that happen? Right? Riddle me that, Batman. How does that happen? How do we get... That's the big change. That's the big variation. How do we get from nothing to something? How do we get from from zero to all of this stuff? Right? And and I think that what Hopkins is, is getting at is something like this. Something like in every thing, in, in every little, you know, rose mole on the, on the belly of a trout, he's seeing this impossible miracle of creation. Whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how, with swift, slow, sweet, sour, a dazzle, dim, all these pairs of opposites, right? So now he's giving us 
uh, not specific objects, but he's giving us attributes. So they're going to have a more general application. Um, but notice what he does with every pair of opposites. They're all alliterative, right? Swift, slow. As they're complete opposites in meaning, but because they have the same sound, see, it's as if he's conveying the experience that these two things, which are 180 degrees opposite, somehow they're all the same. They're the same. It's all Tweedledee and Tweedledum, yin and yang. And the yin and the yang are always part of this bigger whole. Slow, uh, uh, sweet, sour, a dazzle, dim. Right? So it's all pairs of 180 degree opposites, yet somehow they're all the same, and somehow they're all good, including the things we think of as bad. Right? We tend to, we tend to favor the swift over the slow. We like the sweet better than the sour. We like the dazzling better than the dim. But by setting them up like this, showing the sameness, it's like saying, hey, it's all good. You know, it's the God's vision. You know, you do seven days, six days of creation. On the seventh day, you look back, hey, how did I do here? And he saw that it was good. Like seeing with those eyes, which are the enlightened eyes. With, so the so the whole poem has been about changes, changes across space and across time, change, 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 variation, variation. So, and then he gets to down to the the nub of the whole thing. Where's this all come from? He he fathers forth, right? God, he fathers forth, whose beauty is past change, right? Beyond change. Trans transcends all change. All the change, it's like all the change is the evidence of the changeless. All the change is the display of the changeless. He fathers forth. And notice that, that the, when he gets to God, God gets the alliteration treatment as well. Fathers forth, right? Father, you know, of course, he's speaking with the Catholic vocabulary here, so it's God the Father. Fathers. So there's the Father. We could just say the Father, God the Father, Pfft. right? Inert, static. There's God on his throne. Done. A abstract, before creation. Father's fourth. And then we get the fourth, and okay, there's the creation. There's the creation. Oh, Father turns out father is not just a static noun, it's an active verb. He fathers forth. So it's as if out of the magic of the language, the magic of the sounds, it's as if we're seeing there's the magic of creation. There's how it happens. How is it that all this creation, all this stuff, with all, with all its differences, can come, can emerge from this... Father, which is beyond all change, which has no differences. And the, the answer is they're somehow the same. All the, all, the, the, all the difference, all the infinitely variegated form. I'm, right, I'm wearing the right shirt for this today. All these spots on. All the infinitely variegated change is non-different is of the it, it it never stops being that the god the beingness which is changeless which has no variations like if we try to explain it logically it makes no sense because our our logic and our language are developed to talk about the relative not not the absolute um yeah, Tova, I'm trying to unmute you here. There you go. Yes, Tova. So, um, thank you for this wonderful exposition. But what comes to my mind is that he's doing an impressionist painting with words mm. where the impressionists 
were trying to actually depict light. And he is depicting the light of God through all these variations and through all these, these variations in colors, variations in shapes, in all these uh, um, fickle, freckle, um, the pointillism of, of impressionists mm -hmm. that threw the different dots just mm -hmm. by p putting on, on the canvas dots and the dots became a hole and yes. the hall displayed the light. Yes. And and he is of the time of the Impressionists. Yes, yes. So that's what um, yeah. he's actually painting light. Thank you. I ne I've never seen it like this before, Tova. You've just made it much richer for me. Yes, it is. It's Impressionistic and it's pointillistic. You know, it's 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 Surat. He's seeing all those tiny little dots of variation, and and yet and when you see a Surat, uh, and you know, I've been lucky enough that Yaffa has pulled me off to Paris a couple of times to see these things in in person, and you know what's remarkable is it's all dot dot dot, all difference 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 difference, but there's the the unity of the whole thing. It's all this one harmonious composition and that's that's yes that's how he's how hopkins is seeing the the world the universe yeah there it is <laughs> right thank you uh yeah it's so uh, hopkins is seeing the the universe that way it's it's that impressionistic painting the painting of the the ultimate artist yeah so you know what's What's left? What can we say? He fathers forth whose beauty is past change. Praise him. You know, so what do we do about all that? The whole thing has been a perception. Okay, this perceiving. Look, 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 look. Right? We get 10 lines of that. Look, look at all that. And now having seen it, wow, what can we do about it? Just I go, whoa. Thank you. <laughs> there's nothing. There's no other appropriate response. But to but but to praise this miracle. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? Anybody? Okay. Well, it's only. Oh yes, Barbara, please. Uh, let me. I'll unmute you. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I just, I just wanted to say it's funny that you mentioned that about your shirt because that's what I thought of immediately. Is that now going to be your Hopkins shirt? <laughs> 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 but uh, I really appreciated Tova br bringing that all together as art. Mm -hmm. You know, because I, I never ever would have made the connection without mm -hmm. her help. <laughs> so thank you, Tova. Right. Me neither. Me neither. I'm 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 good at hearing stuff. I'm good at hearing language and hearing music, but my visual sense is is not strong. Um, uh, I mean, I still I still if I have to draw something, I draw it like a second grader, uh, and 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 I've always had to depend on others, mostly on women, uh, just the way things have worked out to to point out help open my eyes to the, the visual world. And, um, you know, I was married to an artist. Now I'm married to a filmmaker. So that's, that's worked out. Yeah. Good. Anything else? Uh, yeah, Judy, let me, I, I will unmute you. Hang on. I'm trying. Hang on. Oh, there we go. Yes. Uh, no. Hold on a sec. I'm determined to get you in here. Okay. Yes, Judy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
No, somehow I'm not getting you. I can't, Judy, can't, I can't hear you. You unmuted me. Yeah, I, I unmuted everyone, but somehow I'm not hearing Judy. Yeah. Okay. Pete? We'll do it next time. We're going to, we clearly, we got to do at least one more Sunday of, of Hopkins. So, we'll, Judy, let's note down your comment and we'll, we'll get it next time. Yeah, I can't. Uh, Whatever you're saying, I'm not getting it. Send me, send me an email or something, okay? Okay, sorry. I know it's, I know it's uh, frustrating. Okay, anything else? It's actually time for us to go. We don't, don't want to keep anyone from dinner time. So, Dean, I, yes, I, Bob. Yes, please. Just to say that as someone who is very unfamiliar with poetry, this has just been very illuminating to to understand what what the poet is doing through through sound good uh, thank you very much oh good 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 thank you for that um yeah and you know uh bob hopefully you come back for a couple of these and you start once you start to get a sense of you know there was a book years ago called how does a poem mean mm. Mm -hmm. Right, not what does the poem mean, but how does a poem mean? How okay. are these different? How are these different elements used? What are the different kinds of levels of how they can all produce meaning? And um, you know, it's like you know, one of the things that's made my life very rich. You know, when I previously started studying film and writing about film, and now watching films a lot with 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 Yafa through her filmmaker's eye is I'm just getting so tuned into how a movie means, how the different camera angles and the different kinds of lighting and the different rhythms of the, of the editing and so forth can all produce emotional yeah. meaning and, and so forth. And it's the same kinds of thing, the same kinds of effects with a poem. Um, I mean, a different set of effects, but you know, analogous. So when you start to get a sense of how poems mean, and then you can start getting this richer sense of it on your own, it's really fun. Really cool. right, right. Is there a book that I should be looking at? Is you referring to a book? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, so this is a book that uh, we're using. It's The Enlightened Heart, uh, okay. edited by Stephen Mitchell. It's the best oh. col collection I've found of um, enlightenment-oriented poetry. So, and and... Most or all of the poems we'll be doing this series are in that book, so I recommend it. Okay. And also, also I recommend it because it's great. I think you can hear me now, can you? Yes, yes. <laughs> I Go just on. wanted to read it once again before we end it. Oh. And you could just read the... Sure, but okay. But we don't have time now. Yeah, no, no, it's, it. no it's okay. We, we're, we, I, I can't resist that invitation. Because if I get one more minute on stage with this, that's fine. So, no, that's a great idea, Judy, because we've been breaking it down. And now what we want to do, you're absolutely right, is put it all back together. So you can hear it, hopefully, with the richness of all this going on. Pied beauty. Glory be. Oh, but I got to mute you. <laughs> okay. Glory be to God for dappled things, for skies of couple color as a brinded cow, for rose moles all in stipple upon trout that swim, fresh fire coal chestnut falls, finches wings, Landscape plotted and pieced, fold, fallow, and plow, and all trades their gear and tackle and trim. All things counter, original, spare, strange, whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how, with swift, slow, 
sweet, sour, a dazzle, dim. He fathers forth whose beauty is past change. Praise him. Okay. Good. May all beings swiftly have their eyes open to that beauty that is all around them. That having seen which all we can say is, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Thank you. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Thank you. Thank you. Happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Cynthia. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> <laughs>